Welcome to your organized labor movement video. In this video, we're going to be talking about working conditions in factories through the um, rise of labor unions and then labor strikes. We got a lot to talk about, so let's jump right in it. In the late 1800s, the number of Americans working in agriculture steadily declined. And you guys can see that in the chart. That the green is the agriculture, which means farms. Yellow is the industry. You're talking about factories. And you can see how the green is going down. Yellow is going up. Uh, a sweatshop is a small factory where employees would have to work long hours under very poor conditions. And they basically employed women who would work long hours on machines making mass-produced items. Now, factory work was very dangerous. The workplaces were poorly lit, overheated, badly ventilated. Some workers would lose their hearing from the noisy machines, and accidents were very common, uh, partially because of faulty equipment, but also because of lack of proper training. Nevertheless, despite all these harsh conditions, employers suffered no shortage of labor. There were always people that wanted to work. And by the end of the 1800s, nearly one in every five children between the ages of 10 and 16 worked rather than attend school. And many of these kids that were working suffered from stunted physical and mental growth. And this basically would prompt state legislators to pass laws that would help stop child labor. But we'll talk about that in a moment. Here are some pictures of child workers, young girls working on machines. You see they even have a step stool because they're too short. And a young boy that's been injured working in the factory. Now, with all these poor, harsh conditions, you have the rise of labor unions. So let's get started with the basic question of what is collective bargaining? Collective bargaining is the process in which employers negotiate with labor unions about hours and wages and other working conditions. Process in which employers negotiate with labor unions about hours, wages, and other working conditions. Now, the very first labor union gets founded. It gets founded pretty early in 1834, and it's known as the National Trades Union. But eventually, the U.S. goes through an economic depression. Jobs are lost. If people aren't working, there's no one to join the labor union, and so it basically just kind of fizzles out. But while it's fizzling out, something is getting really hot in Europe, and that is socialism. What is socialism? Basically, it's a philosoph philosophy that favors public instead of private control of property and income. Socialists believe that the society, everyone, should have a say in land and in wealth, and that the wealth should be distributed equally to everyone. That's the general idea of it. Now, uh, when the expanded essay gets written by, you guys will probably recognize the name of Karl Marx, titled The Communist Manifesto, um, denouncing capitalism, which is what America runs on, and they also predicted that workers would eventually overturn capitalism. Many Americans rejected the idea, and they thought that socialism threatened American ideals. The wealthy in particular, like the guys like uh, J.P. Morgan, Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, those guys, they really opposed socialism because they felt like it threatened their fortunes. Because, again, they have all the money. They're not distributing it equally to everyone. However, on the flip side, many labor activists borrow ideas from socialism to support their goals for social reform. So even though the first labor union was a failure, future labor activists are going to borrow from socialism to get their point across. Now, let's just think for a few. Can you think of a government program that exists today that's an example of socialism? And if you guys can't think one off the top of your head, do some research because I actually want an answer to this. And then take a look at this cartoon. What do you think the message of this cartoon is? And then how do you think Americans view socialism? With the idea of socialism, new activists gather together and you have the rise of two new labor unions, the Knights of Labor and the American Federation of Labor, the AFL. So the Knights of Labor gets formed in 1869 and they had three main goals, shorter work days, ending child labor, and equal pay. The Knights of Labor actively recruited African Americans, and because they recruited African Americans and they also allowed women to join, their membership was over 700,000. 
and it was across the nation, every race, every ethnicity. However, after a series of failed strikes, the Knights of Labor basically disappeared. They didn't really manage to accomplish anything. On the flip side, you have the AFL. Now, the AFL gets founded in 1886. They had a smaller membership because they did not allow women to be members and even though they said that they were open to African Americans they usually found a way to um, exclude them. Now I want you guys to read this um, this preamble, this intro into the Knights of Labor Constitution. It's written, you know, the way that it was written in 1878. I want you guys to read it, to analyze it, and to translate this paragraph into modern English. And here is a graph that shows the rise of membership in labor unions from 1897 to 1920. You can see how it just basically goes straight up. It's a very steep um, rise. Lots of people were joining labor unions. It was very popular for people, especially those working in factories. Now, the people that were working in factories, they had things that they wanted um, their employers to give them, whether it was uh, equal pay for men and women or shorter work days, but they were going to strike. And we're going to talk about four major strikes that occurred during this time. The first one is the railroad strikes of 1877. Now, obviously, this occurs in the railroad industry. The striking workers were responding to wage cuts, and they caused massive property destruction in several cities. Uh, state militias, like the National Guards, were called in to protect strike breakers. And strike breakers are temporary workers that are hired to perform the jobs of striking workers. Um, eventually, because of the massive um, violent strikes that were happening, the fighting, the federal government has to step in and send troops to restore order. So that's the first strike. The second one had that we're going to be talking about is the Haymarket Square, and that happens in 1886. So on May 1st of 1886, thousands of workers across the country are going on strike for an eight-hour workday. You have strikes that erupt in several cities, and then you have fights that start breaking out between the strikers and the strike breakers. Eventually, the fights start breaking out between the strikers and the police. Now, everything kind of comes to a boiling point on May 4th when you have all these protesters that are gathered in the Haymarket Square of Chicago. Um, a bomb gets thrown by someone. It kills a police officer. Dozens of other people, both, both protesters and policemen, eventually get killed. You have eight anarchists, and anarchists are people that oppose government. Um, they were tried for murder. Four of them were executed. And basically, the Haymarket Riot is famous because it leaves an unfortunate legacy. Um, this is basically the end of the Knights of, Lib of Labor that we just talked about. This is kind of how they come to an end because they started to associate the Knights of Labor with um, anarchy and anarchists. And employers became even more suspicious because every time you had a strike, you basically had a violence. And so much of the general American public had a very negative view of the Knights of Labor after the Haymarket Square violence that occurred in 1886. The third strike that's on here, the Homestead Strike that happens in 1892, actually happens at a Carnegie Steel plant in Pennsylvania. So at this plant, they cut workers' wages, and the union obviously calls for a strike. Now, Andrew Carnegie's partner, Henry Frink, he was basically like the manager of the plant. He responds to the strike by calling in the Pinkertons. And the Pinkertons were a private police force, and they were known for their ability to break up strikes. Now, the Pinkertons come in, and they basically kill several strikers, wound others in a standoff that lasts for two weeks. Finally, the... Um, the union wasn't backing down. The public wasn't really um, on the union side because of the violence that was going on. And because the public opinion was turning against unions, the unions decide to call off the strike. And the Homestead strike kind of became um, part of an epidemic of steel workers and miner strikes that took place as, econo as economic depression was spreading across America. So basically, people are starting to lose jobs. You have an economic slump that's coming, and now you have all these strikes that are occurring and lots of violence. So basically, nothing happens. It gets called off, 
no win for the workers or for the labor unions. And basically you also had troops and local militia that were, that were called in and that's never good. Finally, the last one is the Pullman strike and that happens in 1893. So the Pullman strike um, basically would do luxury railroad cars, like trains. And they laid off workers and reduced wages by 25%. Now the inventor, George Pullman, he's the one that owned the company, um, required the workers that worked in his company to live in a company town. So they would live in this company town and George Pullman would control the rents and would control the price of the things that they would buy, like milk, meat, that type of things. Um, and the people that were working in the company had to live in these company towns and they had to buy their things from there. So they had to, they were forced to, you know, pay the rent that George Pullman said and to pay what he said for the goods and they, ha they couldn't go anywhere else. In May of 1894, so this is now over a period of time, workers wanted to negotiate with Pullman and he responded by firing three workers and then shutting down the plant. Now, obviously people were freaking out because now a variety of people are losing their jobs um, and they call for a nationwide strike. So by the summer of 1894, you had nearly 300,000 railroad workers that had just walked off their jobs. And that's how the Pullman strike got started. And it escalates when it starts um, impacting railroad traffic and then also mail delivery. The railroad owners cited the Sherman Antitrust Act, remember which we covered in that last video, and they argued that the union was basically illegally disrupting free trade. And believe it or not, the U.S. government sides with the um, Pullman, and they send in federal troops ending the strike, and that's the end of that. They get... Um, nothing basically and they learned that the US government is going to use the acts which was supposed to help them really against them now I want you guys to think why did the workers turn to strikes as tactics to win why didn't they think of something else to do and then why were employers generally opposed to labor unions and I want you guys just to take a uh, a look at a couple of pictures here. You have the Haymarket Square drawing that's on the top left hand corner. Um, you can see the violence, you see the cops on one side, the strikers on the other, the police are aiming their guns into the crowd, and then the flyer underneath is written in both English and in German so that immigrant workers could also understand and participate in what was going on. On the right hand side you have the Pullman strike. Now the top picture of the Pullman strike are the strikers that are walking out of the factory back to their company town. And in the bottom picture you see the National Guard of Illinois guarding the factory from the strikers when the, when the factory was kind of like closed off from them. We have one more um, strike that we're going to get into, but before we get into that, I want you guys to do a little bit of research really quick. You don't have to look extensive with it, but can you think of a present day situation where a union is battling with its employer. Just do some research and just gain a little bit of insight of what's going on. And the final strike that we're going to be talking about, and we're going to be talking about this also in class, is the Newsy strike of 1899. So a Newsy was a young kid, often homeless, that would sell newspapers for a living. You can see the little boy here on the trolley with the newspapers in his hand. The Newsboys Strike of 1899 was youth-led by kids, and it was to force the change in the way that George Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst newspapers compensated their child labor force. So you have two owners of two different newspapers, Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst, and they wanted to be compensated fairly. So in 1899, the Evening World and the Evening Journal, those are the two newspapers, started charging the newsboys 60 cents for every 100 copies of the paper. That was up from 50 cents. And that pissed off a lot of newsboys, and so they went on strike. In the summer in July of 1899, a large number of New York City newsboys re refused to distribute the papers of Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst. And the strike started in New York City and eventually starts traveling over into Manhattan. And it brings traffic to a standstill. And it also halts the distribution 
to New England City. So several rallies are drawing in more people, and at one point you have over 5,000 new boys that were participating in this strike. They have protests all over Manhattan, they get into fights with the men and the boys that were hired to replace them as workers, and the strike lasts for two weeks. Basically, by the end of the strike, you have, um, for example, Pulitzer's newspaper, The New York World, its circulation was at 360, 360,000 per week, 100,000, I'm sorry, um, per week, and it drops down to just 125. The strike works because, obviously, they want circulation to get back up, and they agree that they're going to keep the price at 60 cents per 100 papers, but if they don't sell anything, they will, they could sell their unsold papers back to Pulitzer and to Hearst. Now, if this sounds a little bit confusing, we're going to clarify the newsies when I see you guys in class, so don't worry. Here's another picture of all the young boys selling newspapers. And we have reached the end of the video, so are you able to answer these questions? If you are, you are set. If not, go back, rewatch, and fill in some of the missing holes, and I will see you guys tomorrow.